Hi, I'm Mike Holt with MikeHolt.com and uh, we're continuing our series of just covering some code. And first thing I'd like to do is just take a moment to thank God for giving me the opportunity, the skill, the ability uh, to be able to bless others with, with the talents He's given me. Um, we're going through some difficult times right now with the coronavirus and I know that some people are just really stressed out about that. Um, I think we're going to be fine. God's in control. All right. First thing I want to do is talk about Tommy Davis. Brian, you got that video ready to go so I know if I'm going? Okay, so while Brian's getting the video ready to go, um, let me talk about Tommy Davis. This guy drove me crazy. He still actually drives me crazy. I don't know how many years ago he contacted me about an issue that he had a problem with, had to do with disconnecting means, having to do with children, having to do with solar, and Pretty much, I said, look, this is a crusade that you have about disconnecting means that you can open the cover and there's energized parts. I'm sorry, I'm a code guy. Uh, you know, do the best you possibly can. And as you'll see, Brian will play a video here for a second. What this man has accomplished has been pretty amazing. Uh, so let me just kind of talk about what the scenario is and then we'll play that video in a second. This happens to be a PV system. And you can see, here's the earth right here, so you can see that this disconnect is pretty low, which is fine. The code doesn't have a minimum height for disconnecting means. But the way this cover works is you turn the disconnect off and that cover opens up. I never really gave this a consideration or a thought at all. And he's saying, well, the problem with this is a child can go here, turn that disconnect off, open this cover, and get access to energized parts. That's an example outside. Here's an example inside location. Now what Tommy did was he took it before the Maryland state legislation and he actually got a state law change that requires, I believe this might be only limited to solar applications, I'm not sure what the Maryland state law requires, maybe it probably all applications, and that is that you're going to have to have something more than just simply open a switch to get access to it. it, it it's going to require some kind of like a tool or a cable tie, something to make it so that a child can't just open it up without having to have some kind of tool. Here's some more examples that I've got from Tommy. You can see you open up this switch, access to energized parts. I mean, we've all known about this scenario, but we really never gave it a consideration at all. So now, because of Tommy's efforts, uh, other people, and he drove everybody crazy. I mean, he he, he called me all kinds of terrible names. He called the NFPA all kinds of terrible names, the IBEW, I'm sure the IAEI, everybody. He pretty much, I thought, did everything wrong and how to get his crusade to get the code change. But you know what? Tommy's a master electrician. He's trying to get changes in the National Electric Code. And sometimes if you're just a nice guy, it doesn't work out. Well, his system actually worked out. Take a look right here. In the 2020 National Electrical Code, here's what it says about the disconnecting means um, as it relates to equipment. I'm, I'm sorry, this is a system disconnecting means. This is when you have a solar PV system, you need to be able to have a disconnect to be able to turn off the entire PV system. And here's what the rule says. And you see the shaded portions? That has to do with the 2020 code change. The rule says this on 690.13a. The PB system disconnecting means shall be installed at a readily accessible location. Pretty much that's a boilerplate language. The motor disconnecting means has to be readily accessible. The air conditioning disconnecting means has to be readily accessible. The appliance disconnecting means. So everywhere where the code requires a disconnecting means, in general, it's going to have to be readily accessible. Go to Article 100, read what the definition of readily accessible is. That means what? You can walk up to it. You don't have to climb over a ladder. I mean, you don't have to climb over a portable ladder, five-gallon bucket. You don't have to go underneath something to get access to it. You can just walk there. And it makes sense because this disconnecting means um, is a service disconnect. I don't mean service in, in the context of electrical services, just a maintenance disconnect. Somebody's going to work on the PV system or the swimming pool or the motor or the air conditioner or the appliance. They need to be able to have a service disconnect or a, a maintenance disconnect to open it up. Now here was the change made in the 2020 code. Where disconnecting means of systems over 30 volts are readily accessible to unqualified persons. Any enclosure door or hinge cover that exposes light parts will be locked or require a tool. So it shall be locked, you put a lock on it, 
or require a tool to open. Now the code doesn't tell us what kind of tool, it doesn't talk about how we, you know, I, I guess you could put like a, a, a bolt and a nut and you can just tighten it up and you need to have a screwdriver and you need to have to say a, a channel locks or, or some other tool to open it up. So this is a change in a 2020 code. So go back over here, looking at these disconnecting means, it's going to have to have a lock placed on the disconnect so the cover can't open up or some kind of mechanism so a tool would be required. Now that has to do with the PV system disconnect. The next change that was made in solar, this was not a global change that was back in, let's say, uh, uh, Article 110, this, this change he got in the code. Now, he actually didn't submit the public input. I think this public input was submitted by uh, uh, SEI, uh, Solar Energy International, or something like that, or actually, I think it was the Solar PV Association submitted this proposal. He'd given them so much crap. But I guess they thought, you know what, he's a real pain in the butt, but he has a point here. So now we're talking about equipment. So solar equipment, you need a PV system disconnect, and every piece of equipment of solar has to have a disconnecting means, such as the inverter. If you're going to work on an inverter, you need to have a disconnecting means on that type of equipment. Here's what it talks about on PV equipment disconnecting means. 69015A. Isolating switches or equipment disconnecting means shall be installed in circuits connected to equipment at a location at a location within the equipment or within sight and within 10 feet of the equipment. So equipment disconnecting means are, are, are not required to be readily accessible because this equipment might be on a roof or it might be in a location. So it's going to have to be accessible from the equipment. An equipment disconnecting means shall be permitted to be remote from the equipment where the, where the equipment disconnecting means can be remotely operated from within 10 feet of the equipment. I don't know what kind of solar equipment it is, but your PV system equipment must have a disconnecting means either within it or within 10 feet of it. And it has to be within sight. If it's not within it, within 10 feet or within sight, you know, that combination like that, well then you can control it remotely within 10 feet of the equipment. And I, I think I've heard people tell me that basically it's gonna be an app. You take your phone, you have an app on there, boom, you turn off the power to that piece of equipment. Here's what the 2020 change was. Where disconnecting means of equipment operating over 30 volts are readily accessible to unqualified persons. Well, that means that you can climb right up to it. So that would be like in the ground level or you know, something like that where a child can get to it. Any enclosure door or hinge cover that exposes light parts when open shall be locked or require a tool to open. So that was a change that was made. Brian, do you have that video? So I know what's going on. All right, well, let me just finish this up, and then we're going to play Tommy's video. So now there was an update, and Tommy said that he actually submitted some information to UL to change the product standard. I mean, this guy, is he changed the, the Maryland law. He gave so much crap to people in the electrical industry that somebody thought it was a good idea, and the 2020 code changed it, but only for solar. And then he went to UL and said, listen, we need to have some kind of mechanism so this door can't just be opened up without a tool. So there, UL is looking at this proposal that he submitted, and I forgot what the language was called, where they, they want to coordinate this with, the New Mex with Mexico as well as Canada. So there's, there are some standards that actually uh, are correlated with other inter Mexico and Canada. So that's in the process of going on there. All right, Brian, why don't you go ahead and uh, let me know when you start that video and let me know when it's done because I can't see it at my end. Okay, so I didn't even know that I was in that particular video. Tommy just recently was harassing me and I've gotten so many emails in the last week or so. He said, go to this link. And I went to that link and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm on that particular video. I would just like to say, it, actually, I'll tell you another story. I got an email from somebody in Philadelphia. Hey, Mike, you know, this Tommy Davis guy, I heard the rumors out there that you're funding him. And you know, that's not a good thing for you at Mike Holt to be funding this guy, Tommy Davis. And I'm thinking, boy, he's pissed everybody off. Number one, I'm not funding Tommy Davis, but I'd have no problem funding Tommy Davis. I mean, but this isn't my crusade. And I would like to take a moment to say, you know what, Tommy Davis, you're my hero. You're a pain. I mean, like, oh my gosh your pain, but I admire the courage, the commitment that you have, and I will work on seeing what I can do. Maybe other people can do the same thing. 
to have this clear safety hazard that we've all is like a we've seen it we didn't even know it was a safety hazard to see if we can get a change for the 2023 code to apply to all disconnecting means that are readily accessible should either be locked or placed in a, in a mechanism so that a tool is required so that somebody who's not qualified is not going to open that cover all right okay i hear i hear that the unfortunately audio did not come on that play, man, that is just like a real bummer. I'm really not happy. This is what happens when I get done. I'm not happy. I get very quiet. Because nobody's going to go back and click on that link. Hmm. Okay, that's what it is. And I apologize for that. Hmm. So Brian says he's going to edit it into the video for people that, are, so those of you are live, um, Maybe Brian can do something and give you a link that you can go to that particular one. And then you can watch that audio, or that video and audio. So sorry for those of you that are watching this live. It's, man, we wanted to be perfect and it wasn't. All right, next question came up, had to do with AFCIs. Mike, my customers are tremendously upset with the tripping of AFCIs. How do you troubleshoot those suckers? Let me tell you a story. I have dual function AFCI slash GFCIs at my house in Florida. And they trip all the time for two and a half years. And my wife is furious. So let's start with that. And then I'll tell you the rest of that story as I go along. All right. Before we get into it, let's just understand what an AFCI is, an arc fault circuit interrupter. I'll give you a shorter version than I normally would do in my theory book because this is covered... And I don't know which my book here, somewhere, my electrical theory book, okay? So let's understand AFCIs. Article 100 defines an AFCI, a device intended to de-energize the circuit when it detects the current waveform characteristics unique to an arcing fault. Now, AFCIs come in circuit breakers. You can see they're like computers. They come in receptacles. I, I got one of the first AFCI receptacles in the country. It was sent to me by Levington. I was so excited. I took it apart. You can't put it back. So just letting you know. If you take one apart, it's over. You're never going to put it back. I mean, there's so many things, springs and things and all things fall over the place. And look at the AFCI. You can see this is a very, very, very smart device. While we're talking about AFCI, it's kind of like off to the side. The 2020 code in 23067 is requiring dwelling units, one or two family dwelling units. Maybe not. I'm not sure if it's one or two family dwelling, so I'm, I'm going to let my team let me know if it's just dwelling units. Um, it's going to be services for dwelling units. That's what it is. Services for one and two family dwelling units. It's going to require surge protection device. And the reason they want surge protection device, take a look at this graphic, is because of the electronic devices. This could have been a GFCI. This one happens to be showing AFCIs. Uh, also smoke detectors. So we have some safety control devices and dwelling units, smoke detectors, GFCIs, AFCIs, dual function GFCIs slash AFCIs. So the 2020 code in 23067 is requiring search protection at the service. Now, when you read it, there's an exception that you can put it at each panel board on the load side of the service, but that's a separate topic. So let's just keep moving. All right, we know they're expensive. We know they're electronic. We know that they're sensitive to transient voltages. All right. So now it said, intended to de-energize the circuit when it detects a current waveform characteristic unique to an arcing fault. We cover this in my electrical fundamentals book, my electrical theory. We talk about waveforms and sine waves and sinusoidal and, you know. All right. This shows a current waveform. Now, I'm not going to get into the details um, and how... This all works out. But what they did was they kind of ran computers and they captured all kinds of sine waves from vacuum cleaners and treadmills and light bulb burning out and motors starting and appliances. And they try to capture every single sine wave signature of a waveform that they could. And then what they would do is they look for this. Number one, that waveform, we're talking about in a parallel sensing mode that that waveform, it has to be over 75 amperes peak. So it looks for that. Is it over 75 amperes peak? Yes. 
Then it takes that signature and it looks at that signature and it does a, with this computer, it does a quick compare to find out, does this match anything that we know of? And if it says, yes, it actually does, then it counts it. It says, okay, well, that's one. Well, that's two. That's three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and it is gone. Now, in the standard, which I don't need to get into, and I don't even remember what they are, it counts the number of wave, the number of half cycle waveforms that's over 75 amperes that have the characteristic of a parallel arcing fault. And then once it gets to that number within a given period of time, then it says, okay, well, then clearly it's an arcing fault, then it opens. Now, there's another, I need to get it, Brian, may, remind me to get a graphic in here. The, the AFCIs today, well, not today, for the last few code cycles, anyhow, they're combination AFCIs. Now, don't misunderstand the word combination AFCI to be a combination GFCI, AFCI. A combination AFCI is looking for an arcing fault that's a parallel, that's hot and neutral, kind of with a cord smushed or something like that. It's also looking for a series arcing fault. That's where you have a cord. You ever seen cords that have been used and twisted a lot and all of a sudden you can see it's frayed? And then, you know, you can see where the conductors come apart. But when the conductors start coming apart, uh, it starts to arc. That's called a series arc. Now, it can only detect series arcs if the actual current on that cord is 5 amperes or more. And, of course, it, it can't use waveforms when it comes to series arcs because it, it can't do that. It works different type of proprietary methods. It, it works off of like a, a frequency, a noise. If you guys have been around, you know, years ago, cars used to have uh, distributors. And then every time the, the, the condenser, no, every time the points open and close, you could hear the noise. Well, then they put a condenser on there, okay? Or an AM radio where you see lightning, you can hear that lightning. So there's, there's frequencies that the manufacturers use to detect series arc. They use a computer internally to detect parallel arcs. That's called a combination AFCI. Now, I don't know if anybody's actually selling any branch circuit feeder AFCIs, which was the old type that was only a parallel sensing device, but that's not permitted by the code. You need to have a combination AFCI, which is combination parallel and series arcing faults. All right, so that's the technology. So where is it required? Um, now, depending on whether you have the 14 code, the 11 code, the 17 code, the 20 code, you need to get to your code book. And I, I had an interesting uh, email conversation with somebody this week. He asked me a question and I thought was pretty fundamental. And the question was like, what size wired mic do you need to use for a dwelling unit circuit? And I'm thinking, well, that's a 12 gauge wire. And I'm like, are you an electrician? Are, are you doing electri electrical work? And he goes, yeah, I'm an electrician. I do electrical work. I'm thinking, one of my, one of my problems as a person is that I'm always a teacher. And I'm always kind of confronting people like, hey, uh, if you're an electrician and you're doing less residential work, you actually should have known what size wire you run to a dwelling unit. You know, I think you need to start studying your code. And he says, well, you know, you're an asshole, this and that. I'm like, that might be true. And I never deny anybody saying something about me. But the bottom line, maybe this is a wake up call. And this goes to everybody. He said, well, why do I have to use the code book? All I have to do is watch your videos. And I thought, okay, you're missing it. So those of you that are watching any of my videos, please, you better have a code book. If you're doing any electrical work, you're doing residential work, I would suggest you go to Article 210, read about that. Anytime you're doing any kind of work, get your code book out, study, get your knowledge. Over here, you can see is, is when I get the full screen here, you can see these are the books that I wrote for you guys to become knowledgeable. So don't think that you're watching this video that you're going to remember anything because you're not going to remember anything. So whether you have the 11, 14, the 17, the 20 code book, it's going to be different, but at least you should know where in the code it's about and what it's saying at the time. So I'm going to tell you the 2020 code. So I hope that you take an attitude that if you don't have a code book and you're not using a code book, what the heck is going to happen to your career? I mean, my gosh, you're useless. You're just a, a, a guy pulling wire. Don't know why you're doing it and how it works. So sorry, that's by teaching coming out of me. I, got no, I can't control that. All right, so the National Electric Code today in the 2020 code lists a whole series of locations where the circuits, 15 and 20 ampere branch circuits, supplying outlets or devices in the following locations require AFCI protection. 
those that are doing residential, you know about this. And, and if you've been doing it for a while and you have different codes, you can see it's been changing as time has gone by. Now, um, changes have been made over the time. This came out in 1999, the very first requirement in AFCI. So we're talking 99, 109. Holy crap. That's more than 20 years. Is that possible? Yes, check my math here. I, I can't believe that. Okay, so in this process of 1999 to 9, they required AFCI protection for uh, dormitories. And by the way, in the 2020 code, they added a definition of what a dormitory is, or they defined the term dormitory. So dormitory, so it's not only residential, um, all the places in, in a residential, and then it's going to be in the dormitories. Also, they added it, um, and then it's required in guest rooms, like hotels, guest suites, like a hotel where like there's a little living area in the front and then you walk into the bedrooms. That's a guest suite. And they added it to limited care facilities. It's almost like not a nursing home. It's kind of like an independent living type of case, limited care facilities. So let's read the text here. This was a 2020 chain. AFCI protection required for all 15 and 20 amp, your 120 volt branch circuits supplying outlets in guest rooms, in guest suites of hotels and motels, no change, and patient sleeping rooms and nursing homes, oh, and limited care facilities. Oh, yeah, I'm saying, the title did say nursing homes. I'm sorry, I missed that. So now that's AFCI protection. It's been expanded to include those locations. Well, let me tell you something. There's a major problem with AFCI breakers. And those of you guys are in the trade, I'm sure you hate AFCI protection. Now, if you talk to the manufacturers, they'll tell you, Mike, there's no problem. It's fine, everything. Let me tell you something, it's not fine. I got a buddy of mine, uh, Rusty Pike, Pike's Electric. He does hundreds, thousands of homes in the villages in Florida, which is a big area. And he is so upset because the customers will call because the AFCI is a trip. And the service calls are just crazy. So now here's my story. Mary told you like two years, maybe three years, my AFCI is tripping all the time. I finally got smart. I'm not that smart of a guy, but I started getting smart. And look what I did. I started putting every, I kept the cover off. I have no kids in the house, so I don't really care. And I kept putting little dots with a magic felt pen every single time it would trip. And I found certain ones kept tripping more than others. And I couldn't, and I'm trying to figure out, was it eight daytime, did I turn on a light, did I run a vacuum cleaner? What was going on? And you know when they trip the most, and I don't know why, they seem to trip overnight. Now, I, my wife is going nuts. She says, listen, I just want the breakers I used to have all my life that you turn them on and they're on. None of this stuff that's tripping. I like, well, She goes, get rid of those things. I said, I can't get rid of those things. I'm Mike Holt, are you kidding me? So I don't care. I want to get rid of I said, babe, you can't get rid of those because they're trying to protect you. Now, mine happen to be dual function, meaning dual function, GFCI and AFCI. So finally, after three years and fighting, I decided to call my buddy, Rusty Pike, who happened to wire my house. I said, Rusty, can you come out here and bring me new AFCI breakers? So we put some new breakers inside there, but they tripped, some of them. It, what, it did better, but they weren't all finished. I'm like, okay. You know what I did? So this is my tip to you. This is free. What are you planning on covering this? If you go into a house and an AFCI breaker is tripping and there's other AFCI breakers in the panel that's not tripping, then here's what you do. You take the AFCI breaker that's not tripping and you put it in the position of the circuit that is tripping because we know the AFCI that's not tripping is not a bad AFCI and we're not having problems. When you put it in the position where it was tripping, then you get the new AFCI breaker. Never put a brand new AFCI breaker in the position of the one that was tripping because we don't know if the new one is a problem. That's the tip I learned. So what do I do? The breaker's tripping, pull that puppy out, take the breaker that was above it, put it in this position, put it back on again, get the new AFCI breaker, put it inside the panel, and guess what? I think they're pretty good right now. So I'm not having a problem. What was my point? Well, number one is like, don't, if somebody calls you about AFCI tripping, don't go in and start taking switches apart and receptacles apart, trying to troubleshoot this thing and find this. Now I'm talking about not a brand new installation. 
see on a brand new installation, there could be some wiring errors. I'm just talking about in an installation, it works. If the breaker is working, then it's fine. That means there's no problem. Then it trips. Now, if clearly they say, when I turn on this light, it, turns, it trips the breaker, well, then that's fine. But in the absence of an event taking place, causing the protection device to open, and it just randomly happens. Now, my son has done this, and I've heard of the guys, well, what I do is I go in there and I take the circuit, and I, I find out the receptacles were backstabbed, or the switches were backstabbed. These are 15 amp circuits, and I replace that. Listen, you charge the customer money, you didn't fix the problem. So don't do any of that. Just simply pull the breaker out, take the breaker that was adjacent to it, put it in, get a new breaker on the circuit that was not tripping. And you know what's gonna happen? You know what's gonna find out? It's not gonna be tripping anymore. It's not wiring errors. Now, a brand new house being built, brand new, or a brand new installation, or going into an existing facility and then putting GFCIs or AFCIs in an existing facility, oh yeah, you're gonna have some problems. We'll talk about that. So that's a tip. That's the only way I know of to troubleshoot AFCIs when they just randomly turn off. Okay. All right. We'll get some questions coming in. Let's see what we got. All right, All right Mike. Uh, you're going to love this one. The guys are asking why there's dots that you're putting with the marker on the side of the panel. Brian, a question or no? Okay, why are the dots on the side of my panel? Because every single time I would get up in the morning and my wife is furious because the kitchen AFCIs were tripping, it was dual function, okay? I would go out there after a while, after I started getting smart, I left the cover off and I put a dot and a dot. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, da, 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 That way, because what happens is it trips. And then you put it back on again. Well, then you go back. I don't know which one tripped. So that's it. Okay, I'm glad you asked that question. If you have AFCIs tripping and you go in and you do a service call, say, you're all good. They're like, oh, fine. Then a week later, it, it trips again. Here's what I tell you to do. Tell them to get some way to mark on the cover. Of course, you're not going to take the cover off. Mark on the cover in a way every single time that they turn that back on. So you can get there and know which circuit tripped and how often it was. So hopefully that answered the question as to why I did that. All right, no more questions. So now I get an email from a guy. He said, Mike, I was watching a video and I saw that you're gonna talk about AFCIs and how to troubleshoot them. Here's what I do. He says, I love AFCIs. Now most electricians hate AFCIs. I love a B AFCIs because they make my customers safer. You're all like, whatever, buddy. And I have come to redefine the issue of AFCI nuisance tripping as actually being nuisance circuits. He's saying, I'm finding out there's actually problems with the circuits. And I'm thinking, I want to hear about this. I can't tell you how many shared neutral circuits I have found using AFCIs. See what it was. He did work, I can't remember, in the Northeast somewhere. He said like 100-year-old houses and there's knob and tube wiring and there's just all kinds of where people have modified things all over the place. And what he said was, he tells people, look, this is an old house, old wiring. You know, there is an end of life of anything. This wire is maybe not that safe. How about we do a service upgrade? I don't have a problem with that. How about we change your fuses to circuit breakers? I don't have a problem with that. And how about we put dual function AFCI, GFCIs? I don't have a problem with that. That makes total sense. He says, and Mike, when I do that, he goes, I have all kinds of problems. And I tell my customer, look, when I do this upgrade, the wiring errors that's inside, we're going to find hazards inside your wiring. That's not part of this cost of upgrading. That's going to be troubleshooting to try to figure out what do we got to do to make that safe. So that's why he comes from, he goes, man, I do a service upgrade, put a panel inside there, I put dual function, AFCIs, GFCI protection device in there, that sucker trips. Now we gotta troubleshoot it. And here's what I found out is what he says. He says, listen, I can't tell you how many shared neutral circuits I have found using AFCIs. I've also found circuits sharing a neutral into a different panel, or three hots sharing two neutrals, and four circuits sharing three neutrals. Brian and I and some other team members and I um, have actually done some work and, and we're 
were watching electrical magnetic fields in a particular person's house. And we found out with a milligauss meter, there's, I'm not saying it's causing cancer or not, or causing people to go crazy or not, I don't know. All I know is that you can easily remove the EMF fields of miswired applications by putting dual function breakers on every single 15 or 20 ampere circuit in a dwelling unit. Because what's gonna happen is this, and we've seen this, right Brian? We saw where there were cross neutrals and multiple circuits and there were neutrals coming out of different panels. I mean, we were there for a long time, practically disassembling all the wiring inside the walls. We did, we did that, we had people doing that. And Brian was doing that with Rusty Pike and Pike's Electric. And we, we reconnected everything. And by putting dual function AFCIs, GFCIs, guess what? See, the electrons lead the power supply. Those electrons are going to return to the power supply. And they're going to return to the power supply in all the available paths. And the way we want circuits to operate is electrons go out on the hot, and those electrons come back on the neutral of that circuit. We don't want electrons going out of one hot, and somehow there was multiple neutrals and they put a big blue wire nut on all the neutrals. And so now electrons are going out on hot, but now it's returning back on all these multiple neutrals or a cross neutral and they're returning back on another neutral coming to another panel. So, so that's a hazard and that's electrical magnetic field. So what he was saying is, hey Mike, I put these dual function AFCIs, GFCIs, that sucker trips and I've detected all these different types of wiring errors. And I'm like, well, for a service guy putting in new circuits, makes sense, no problem. But he, so let's talk about what the code tells us about multi-wire brand circuits. See, electrons go out on a hot, and they return back on a neutral. Well, you could have two hots in a neutral or three hots in a neutral for a three-phase system, which means you have three hots or two hots in one neutral. And it's, I'm not gonna get into, well, how does that work out, Mike? And can you have an, uh, an AFCI or a GFCI? Well, I won't get an AFCI. See, electrons go on the two hots, and there's a common neutral or a shared neutral or an Edison circuit, whatever you might wanna call it there. That means that the electrons are going out and returning in its proper path. And if you put an amp meter around two hots and a neutral, properly wired, you will detect what? Zero amps. Perfect. Well, the AFCI and the GFCI is doing the same thing. It's measuring current going out on the phase conductors, measuring the current coming back on the neutral conductors, and if it's properly wired, it'd be fine. But if current goes out on the hot, not returning on that neutral, well, then, of course, the AFCI is not even going to turn on. It's going to trip immediately, so you have to get them to work. So, so that's a multi-wire brand circuit. So what's the deal on multi-wire brand circuits? Here's what the code says. All conductors of a multi-wire brand circuit must originate from the same panel board. Well, when the guy had the problem with different neutrals, different circuits, clearly that's a code violation. Sorry about that. Now let's review multi-wire branch circuits, which we reviewed in the past. Um, here's a line one, here's a line two, there's a two-pole breaker, or there's two single-pole breakers with handle ties. And then you have your common neutral, multi-wire branch circuit. Let's say line one draws five amps, line Two draws 10 amps. Oh, this is wrong here. So unfortunately, that was wrong. That should have been five amps on that graphic, so I apologize for that. Then so, here's another way to look at that. 600 watt TV at 120 volts is gonna be five amps. Uh, 1200 watt hair dryer on 120 volts is gonna be 10 amps. Neutral current cancels. Neutral current is not additive. Apologize for that. So now, what happens if you're in the panel, however, and you take the neutral off of the neutral bus. Well, now you have current going out on the hot, traveling along the neutral portion with the other circuit and coming back on the other circuit. You now have what is called a series circuit. We discussed multi-wire brand circuits in the past on a previous video. Well, you know the resistance. Well, if you know the wattage and you know the voltage, well, then you could calculate out the resistance. And if you know the resistance of the TV and you know the resistance of the hair dryer, 12 ohms, well then you know that the total resistance is going to be 36 ohms. And if you know total resistance and you know the voltage, well then you can calculate the current. And the current comes out to be 6.7 amps. Not that that even matters. What matters is in a series circuit that we cover in fundamentals is current remains the same and every resistor in a series circuit 
has the same current as a circuit current. Guys, if you're learning theory, and if you haven't done theory in a long time, get my theory library. And if you've been doing theory or, or you're an apprentice of theory, it's really, really important that you understand series circuits, parallel circuits, multi-wire brain circuits. Okay, so guess what happens? You open the neutral here, the TV becomes 160 volts, and the hair dryer gets 80 volts. And of course, Murphy's Law is that the most expensive piece of equipment will always protect the least expensive piece of equipment. And of course, you can see that $2,500 flat screen TV that's eight whatever hertz frequency, megahertz or whatever it is, 8K eight, uh, eight K, eight K frequency, it's going to protect your popcorn machine. That's the way it's going to work out. Just talking about multi-wire brand circuits, the advantage of multi-wire brand circuits, you have one less wire. We talked previously, it's going to be 50% less voltage drop. Let's go on. Here's what the guy said. So I need you to have the understanding of how multi-wire circuits operate. Here's what he said in his email, and this is what caused me some concern. He says, I treat the AFCI or GFCI as a tool rather than as a problem. Okay, I agree. If you put dual function or, or GFCIs or AFCIs, and if there's any miswiring, the way the electronics are designed is they don't expect any neutral to ground connections. They don't expect, you know, your neutral in your equipment grounding conductor connecting. They expect current to go out on the hot, coming back on the neutral, not traveling on any other path. So it's a great device as a tool. He says, here's what I do. I disconnect the hot wire. Okay, well, no, wait. you have an AFCI, it tripped. So, okay, well, what I do is I disconnect the hot wire off that AFCI is tripping. And check for voltage on the neutral conductor to the neutral bus in the panel. In other words, I see this hot wire has this neutral. And then what I do is I take the hot wire off of the AFCI. And then I check the voltage of that neutral conductor at the panel to the neutral bus. My head is going, wait a minute. You don't want to do that because that might be part of a multi-wire branch circuit. And the moment you take that neutral off, you don't know how the wiring is going to be, whether there's other circuits connected in there, in a configuration multi-wire branch circuit, and then you will wipe out the equipment. So back over here. Hey, I treat the AFCI, GFCI as a tool rather than a problem. I disconnect the hot wire off of that breaker that was tripping the, the electronic breaker and check for voltage on the neutral conductor to the neutral bus of the panel. Don't do that. You never take a neutral off of a neutral bus because you don't know if it's part of a multi-wire brand circuit. If there's voltage, I turn off, if there's voltage, that means, I don't know what's going on. For sure, there's another circuit supplying something, but there might've been two circuits supplying it. And I turn off breakers until it stops. Bingo, shared neutral. The concept is I'm sorry, uh, if, if there's voltage, no, no, if there's voltage, because he's taking a voltmeter to check this, opening it up. Now, what he could do is not take the neutral off and have this problem here. What he could do is, unfortunately, sorry, that drives me nuts. He could put an amp meter on that neutral. If that neutral conductor is carrying current, well, then... We know it's being shared by another circuit. Then start turning off your breakers to determine which breaker, and there might be more than one breaker, that's contributing to that neutral conductor. Then you're going to have to go in and troubleshoot the circuit. Brian, um, I, I made a comment on this, and you sent me an email. We never discussed it. Does this answer the question why I, I was concerned about not opening the neutral and, and using the a voltmeter to check the voltage? but rather to use an amp meter to check the current to see if there's another circuit supplying. Yeah. We got to turn on the loads, of course, because if not, the, you know. All right. Anybody, any um, questions? We Brian? have a comment. Voltage is half going to ground. So I don't know if you maybe want to just address that real quick. The comment was voltage is half going to ground. I have no clue what that means. Let me tell you what the voltage is. Let's assume it's not a multi-wire brand circuit. Let's assume, well, let's just assume that there's another circuit connected to that neutral and the other circuit that tripped is off. 
if you take the neutral off, and I'm curious if you guys, and Brian, I'm curious yourself also, if I take that neutral off of the bus and I see a little spark and I take a voltmeter between the two and it's only one circuit connected to that neutral and it's a dwelling unit, what would that voltage be? Brian? Well, it's going to be 120 if that's a 120 volt circuit. Exactly. Yeah. It's a yeah. 120 volt circuit because the hot goes out, it goes to the equipment, it comes back on the neutral, which it, and it was drawing three amps, but you didn't measure what you should have. Then you take it off, and it's not part of a multi wire branch circuit, let's just say. So now you do what? The neutral conductor is just part of right. the hot wire, and then when you take a voltmeter, you're going to measure voltage. That's not what you want to do. And by the way, just getting into, we, you know, kind of drifting off inside there. Um, you can get nailed with a neutral conductor, right? Because you take a neutral off, you're thinking, oh, you're a white wire, you're safe, I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about the red wire, the blue wire, the black wire, because we know those are energized. But when you take the neutral off the neutral bus, and that circuit is energized, then, then you have 120 volt potential. A lot of people- That's how I know it had 120. Touching the neutral and touching. <laughs> that's how you know. That's, that's how, how I know it had 120. You know 120. You know what I thought? I thought the voltage was less. Not that I did the math, but if you do a series circuit that you have whatever, one resistor in series, right, and you connect yeah. and it was drawing two amps and it had 120 volt circuit, well, if you take it off and the voltmeter, the, the impedance of the voltmeter is so high, and that's what we cover in fundamentals, and the, the way voltage is distributed on a circuit according to the law of proportion, if your voltmeter is 10,000 ohms and your load is, let's say, uh, uh, probably, let's say, 300 ohms, well, you're going to measure 120 on your voltmeter. We got one more comment. Right. Let's continue <clears throat> one on. One more here. Uh, okay. This is yes. from uh, Peter Furrow. He says, "Hey, AFCIs have over voltage protection too. If there's a primary voltage problem, it opens at 160 volts." Uh, and a comment: Does this or this protects the equipment in the home? Okay, I don't know for a fact, but I believe it's probably true. You had to realize something. Let's go back over here. On this multi-wire branch circuit, this could happen on a utility. If a utility loses their neutral, you could end up having one line of in, in your built in your house, okay, 160 volts, and the other line could be 80 volts or any combination thereof. If you had a a AFCI breakers on that two pole on that multi-wire branch circuit or any one circuit, utility loses the neutral. The voltage goes so up so high that it's an over voltage condition and apparently electronic protection device, I don't know if this is true or not, they, they self protect themselves. And when they see over supposedly 160 volts, then they just disconnect off of the circuit, which makes total sense. I'm not saying that it's a fact because I haven't read it, but I believe that if you were a manufacturer of AFCIs and GFCIs, utility lose the neutral, you've already smoked a lot of all your phase A AFCIs or GFCIs have, have been gone bad, and then they've kind of realized, okay, we need, besides having surge protection internal, they apparently have some kind of electronic over-voltage protection. But that's a product standard, and you know what? It doesn't even matter to me because I have no control of that. Because if you took the loss of neutral and, you, and, and it did or did not self-protect itself and it gets smoked, the utility's gonna say, we didn't lose a neutral, we didn't have a problem, everything is fine, and then, it just dies. That's the way it works. All right, no more questions. So back over here, finishing up AFCIs and multi-wire branch circuits, the code requires each multi-wire branch circuit must have a means of simultaneously disconnect all phase conductors at the point where the branch circuit originates. So you can put like a, a two-pole breaker. So you have to have a way simultaneously disconnect. That doesn't mean that if one phase trips the other phase of the circuit breaker has to open. It just means that you have to mechanically get there and turn that sucker off so you can turn it off. And what does the code permit? It permits two one-pole breakers with an identified handle tie, not a nail and a screw or anything like that, or a piece of 12 wire or 10 wire, or a, a, or, or a common trip breaker, like a two-pole breaker. Okay, so that's a disconnecting means. But if one circuit, let's say there was a fault in this one on the black circuit here, that doesn't mean that when you trip the black circuit here, 
that the red circuit has to open at all. Some manufacturers have breakers where, where one felt phase of the two or the three opens, it actually will open up all three phases. But if you take single pole breakers and you put handle ties in between them, particularly square D, if you put that little pin in between like that, one will trip and the other one won't. You know, or you've seen these, uh, these, uh, these twin breakers with the little tandem connections. You've, you've seen how those things, you know, that's okay because it's a simultaneous disconnect, you mean. Um, some other things about multi-wire branch circuits because of the hazards in 210.4D is that the phase and neutral conductors of a multi-wire branch circuit must be identified or grouped together by cable ties or similar means in every enclosure. So now there's, there's an exception to this. That's like, well, if you're coming into a raceway and there's only two hots and a neutral, you don't need to identify them. You don't have to group them because it's obvious. So if you bring in some MC cable or armor cable, What's well, obvious. So if it's not obvious, those if I have two, if I have multi-wire branch circuits, I have two of them in there, or I, I need to group those so that why we don't want to cross the neutrals because if you cross the neutral, you're not putting a puppy on a GFCI or two-pole GFCI or AFCI. So that's part of the code because we want to make sure what we want to make sure line one is connected to line one, line two is connected to line two, and you have a common neutral to those two. We don't want to have them line one and line one because you kind of crossed them there. Now, he was also saying, hey, Mike, you know, when I do this troubleshooting, I had a problem with that voltmeter deal. Put the current meter and that meter on there. I'm good with that. And then do the other techniques. He says, if the, F, if the AFCA trips when I start turning on breakers, that's when I know I have another hot coming on that neutral or a second hot shares, hot sharing a neutral with another circuit. So, like, this one's tripping using what I would prefer. Leave the breaker up. Don't take the wire off the breaker. Put an amp meter on that neutral. Say, oh, all right, that's still, well, then just start turning off breakers till you find out which breakers are common to that neutral. Then you guys know how to troubleshoot it, so I don't get into that detail. It's, you know, so, it was a divide and conquer kind of thing. And he goes on. If there isn't voltage on the neutral, I don't like that. I would say what? If there's not current on the neutral, then the issue seems to likely be in a receptacle switch or a light. In other words, I... I you're in a remodel job, right? You, and then you, you put the AFCI and it trips. You're like, man. Then you find the neutral associated with that particular phase conductor, put an amp meter on there. You see no current. Like, holy crap. It's not sharing. But you got to realize something. You got to have the loads on to be able to detect whether or not there's any kind of sharing of loads. So you make sure you turn all the lights, turn everything on, you know, all the lighting, receptacle circuits, plug something in everywhere, keep everything going. Then you turn on the AFCA, that trips, put an amp meter on that neutral. There's no, amp, there's no current on that neutral. You know what that means? It's not a shared neutral. What that means is that somewhere in a box that there is going to be your equipment grounding conductor, your, your ground wire, your bond wire, possibly making a connection to a phase conductor or possibly may be making a connection to the neutral. In other words, you're, you're pushing the wires and then that, that bare equipment grounding conductor touches the neutral and that will also cause for a fact GFCI's trips. And you know what? That would cause an AFCI to trip because see the current goes out on the hot, your neutral is touching the equipment grounding conductor which means not all the currents are turning back on the neutral because it's going to divide on the equipment grounding conductor so the AFCI would trip. So in a brand new house and it trips, that's a troubleshooting thing. Don't use a voltmeter, use the ammeter. If you're in a house and it's not tripping immediately, but I mean it's on then it starts tripping, do the technique that I talked about. Okay, uh, Brian, I'm, I'm done with that. I have one more question and then uh, we're going to go from there. Okay, let's move on. One light question, and then we're going to finish up. Cable tray use in residential wiring. He says, Mike, why can't I use cable tray wiring in a dwelling unit? I'm like, well, you can. But that's depending on the code that you have. For all time, tray cable, or type TC wiring, was not permitted in a lot of locations where it is today. So that's Article 336, tray cable, TC, type TC cable. And what they did was a very fascinating story. Generac is, is, is truly an amazing company. Um, they have great products. I have a problem with their generator instructions. 
So if you know anybody at Generac, tell them my Colt has a problem with the generator instructions because Generac used to say drive a ground rod for their generators. And I gave them all kinds of crap. So they pull it out of their instructions. And somehow somebody migrated that requirement to require a generator from Generac to have a ground or to ground it in some way. Do not follow those instructions. Do not ground that generator. That's a whole different story. This is not the place to talk about um, because that creates a problem with an auxiliary electrode. Go, actually, you know what you can do? Go to MikeHolt.com, go to videos, go to bonding and grounding and watch the very first video. Please do this. Every single one of you watching this video, automatically do that. And then you'd understand what I'm saying. Get a hold of Generac and tell them to get that generator ground rod out of their instructions. Okay, not illegal to do it. What it does is it wipes out generators motherboard and don't know why they would want to do that unless they want to sell more motherboards. I don't know what's the deal there. All right, so what Generac did and they're a fantastic company, other than I like that instruction, they came out with a tray cable that had the two hots, the neutrals, and Brian, what is it, four control conductors inside that control of a Generac? So there's four control conductors, and those conductors, those control conductors are class one, and they're 600 volt rated conductors, and they ran 600 volt rated phase and neutral conductors. They put it within the same jacket. So they made a brand new product with type TC tray cable that included the phase conductors, the neutral conductors, their control conductors, and all the colors that they want. So that when you get to your transfer switch, you bring the tray cable into the transfer switch equipment and you just terminate it according to the colors, right? Doesn't take a lot of intelligence there. It's not like hooking up a thermostat that you're all confused. And then you go over to the generator and you do the same thing as generator. Now, tray cable can be used in a lot of locations. And you, even though they came up with this product, I said, guys, uh, you can't use that product. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying, no, you can't use that product because it's not recognized as suitable by the National Code. I think it was the 2017 code that modified to recognize this language here, and it was revised again for the 2020 code. Here's what it says. Title, TC cable uses permitted, one and two family dwellings. Type TCERJP, let's see, that's tray cable, oh, exposed runs, joint pull. See, Romex, been around for 100 years, and we know that you pull it through joist, uh, joist pull rather, and it can be run exposed. So what happened was in tray cable, they came up with these special configurations. Here's, but if you're gonna use it in a dwelling unit, it has to be what? T-C-E-R-J-P. That's tray cable, exposed runs, joist pull. And, and UL has a standard for these type of scenarios. Is permitted for branch circuits and feeders. So yes, you can use tray cable, branch circuits and feeders. We're installed in accordance with part three of 334, in other words, Romax. If you want to put this inside of a building, this tray cable, you can. And you, you wire it like it would have been what? Romax requirements. And it's, that's part two only, not part three. So we're not going to get into the impasse. And part two of article 340 for exterior wiring. In other words, UF cable is article 340. So if you're going to use this tray cable that Generac supplies, or that you can buy it as a, as, a, a, as a dealer or a distributor, as a dealer, then you can put it inside of a building and you can put it outside of a building and it can be direct buried. It doesn't have to be in a raceway. It doesn't have to be in a cable tray. So the question that was asked was probably like, they wanted to use this cable and the inspector says you can't use a cable and it was probably the 2014 code which said you could not use a cable, but the 17 cable modified it and you can see that the 20, I mean, the 17 code modified it and the 2020 code just kind of improved it a little bit. And that's what it looks like. So you have one, two, three, four, what, you know, there's four, I think, I don't know if that's a conductor. Is that a conductor? One, two, three, four, yeah, five Yeah, Mike, conductors. they actually have uh, Black, six, red, 18. white equipment grounding conductors. It's already pre-sized. So you buy this cable for 22KW, it, 30KW, you buy it. It actually got cables. 618 gauge right. in there now. So the one that you have a picture of there is a little bit older one. The new one now has 618 oh. gauge, and I would imagine they've added some additional controls, maybe for load control and that type of stuff. Probably for load shedding or things like that. 
uh, or they added some additional control. All right, so now there's six conductors for the generators. And uh, one more comment. Okay. Uh, I got to go to bat for my buddies over at Generac. So I just checked a bunch of their new oh, instruction good? manuals. And uh, there's no ground rods in any of the new stuff. So it uh, looks like they got everything cleaned, no uh, cleaned back up. And I, I did actually talk with them. And uh, they were shocked that did. it was in there. I, I don't I don't think it was put back in there on purpose, uh, especially not after the last time you beat them up over it. <laughs> I, I did beat them up over it. It is another story that one day if you get with Brian, say, Brian, tell me the story about Mike Holt at the Generac dealer show and oh well sorry all right well listen we're done for this program um we're gonna be on tomorrow and we're gonna be on thursday and we're gonna be on for the next week by the way probably in may, in may i want to be talking about life skills careers what do you do you're you're an electrician you never went to school you didn't have an opportunity you're an apprentice you're in a school you're you're, you're a journeyman, you got a license, you know, like, what do I do now? You're a master electrician, you're an electrical contractor. Mike, I'm an electrical contractor, I'm getting burnt out, I'm getting tired, or, I, you know, I'm a project manager. We're talking about life skills. That's gonna be the first week of May. And Brian, I know one of these nights, I'm gonna want you to do some POE, power over ethernet. And so that's something I want you to do one of the nights. So I need you to do me a favor. Post questions about, hey, Mike, I'm 22 years old, I'm, I'm 55 years old, I've, I've done this, I've done that. Where do I go to next? What do I do? Um, we are running a special. Brian, I don't know if you can give me full screen here. Here's a bunch of books that I have right here. These are the actual books. Let me tell you something. If you stop reading and you stop watching videos and you stop learning, you're a dinosaur. This industry is changing so, so, so quickly. So every library, not a book, a library includes a video or, or videos or DVDs is 30% off through the end of this month. So go to mycolt.com and then go to products. The best deal you can get is the ultimate training library. And I'm not trying to sell you something, guys. That's not, my career is to change your life and the best investment you can ever make. You're gonna spend more than $1,500 on tools just to get you started. And then you gotta replace them as you leave them up in an attic and as you put them in the dirt and everywhere else like that, and you break it, you run over it, you drop it, you forget it, and you gave it to somebody that doesn't come back. Listen, there's nothing more important in your education. So the ultimate training library, or get a bonding library, or an exam prep library, or a theory library, but it's gonna be 30% off the rest of this month. So God bless, and I will see you tomorrow night. Code for that discount is live. So when you go to check out and ask for a discount code, put on there, live. And if you don't know what you need, hey, Mike, uh, I've done this, I've got this much experience, I'm not quite sure exactly what I need to do, just call 352-360-2620 and just say, hey, Michael told me to call you guys. And everybody in my office is honest, we care about you, uh, they're gonna take care of you and say, listen, can I talk to you? Can I tell you my story? What do I do next? All right, well, God bless and I will see you tomorrow.